Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom, are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hi, Casey. So today's podcast is about avoiding financial advisors that dot, dot, dot. And I think this podcast is super appropriate for the news headlines that we've had recently. It's embarrassing. My, I, I will, I'm always the first to say that financial advising, the business, is the lowest barrier to entry. It costs you nothing really to hang your shingle out and say, I'm a financial advisor. And therefore, in our industry, we get a lot of people that are looking to take advantage of other people, sometimes legally <laughs> and sometimes not legally. So we've got Chris Burns in the news right now. Chris Burns on uh, WSB Radio. He paid to be there. He, he wasn't an employee of the news outlet, but he was supposed to have a, he, he runs a, a firm, hangs his shingle out as fee only, and he's supposed to uh, be looking out for the best interests of his clients. He was about to undergo an SEC audit, which is nothing to be scared about. It's a routine thing in our business that you go through sometimes once a year with these audits. And again, no big deal. This guy goes missing. The day that his audit papers were due with the things that they're asking to review of his firm, he goes missing. So now we don't, we don't know where he is. It's been turned over to the FBI for uh, investigation and try to track his whereabouts down. His car was found. He's nowhere, uh, nowhere around. This is concerning to me. It's an insult to our our industry. Now, allegedly, he has um, done nothing wrong, really. I mean, allegedly, he's just l- may have run off of people's money, allegedly. But it's really ironic that on a day that SEC is going to look at him, he disappears. And here, again, this is a fee-only guy. And we've talked about this before and maybe in some of our beginning of our podcast, but fee-only means that you're working in the best interest of the client and you're not selling product. That's the fiduciary fee-only business model. Why is there set up this way? We're set up to where we are mandated by law to do what's in the best interest of the clients. Then on top of that, we choose not to sell insurance products. Instead, we choose to give financial planning advice. We manage assets. And there's never a conflict of interest between our advice and the products that we use. In fact, the products that we use are almost free. A lot of the index funds today through Vanguard and BlackRock State Street, these cost almost nothing. So here it is in the news. We're supposed to be, as fiduciary feelings, the peak of the business, the best in the business. And this guy has run off, allegedly, with people's money. That makes me angry. That makes me angry. And what really makes me angry is there's people running off with people's money, but they do it legally through annuity sales, Right through whole life policies where not the whole life insurance is bad, but people are being sold whole life because it's going to help their kid in college as savings plans for college. Sometimes I feel like these whole life guys are like, if you need a car in the future, save it into a whole life policy and you can borrow from it. That's the solution to everything. Why? Because it's the biggest payout the advisor can possibly get. It's the biggest payout. That was actually on a nap of his website. Um, Non-fiduciary advisors, like you just talked about with the commission salesman, it's actually estimated that that advice costs investors up to $17 billion a year. $17 billion a year in a product that probably didn't even help them. Right. It's not like I hung my shingle out as fee only from the very beginning of my time in this industry. I started off on the dark side of the business and my boss used to walk around the office in downtown Atlanta screaming at us, there's three people in this relationship and two better be making money. It's 2020. Have we not learned anything and there's smart people out there who know how to change the system. The problem is it comes down to politicians. And unfortunately, the team that could go change it, they get most of their money from insurance companies. There's very little change that's going to happen probably in the U.S. across the board. But we're just talking about just people. I mean, it's frustrating to me. It's, oh, he's a good guy. He coached my Little League baseball team. Oh, he's on TV. He's on the radio constantly. He's on TV. I see him on TV all the time. That's not credibility. That just means you have a bigger marketing budget than the other guy. I thought it was an interesting point you made that, yes, Chris Burns has been on the radio, but he paid to be on the radio. They weren't paying him to be on the radio as a paid employee or 
person who has a lot of knowledge in this area as an expert, right. he was paying them. Right. They were taking his money. They just wanted to fill up airtime. So he was there with the dollar bills to do it. It's no different than other people. And I won't name names because they haven't done anything technically wrong. But other people that you see regularly on TV, these aren't good operators in our industry. These are not the best guys in our industry, right? We meet these people. We meet these people that get sucked into the radio shows, get sucked into, and and all radio shows are bad. There's some great radio shows out there, but how do people know? How do people know what's good and what's bad? And, And we have a checklist that we'll go through in how to find a financial advisor. Of course, you know, I'd be very self serving to say, we're the only solution for you. That'd be very self serving. This podcast is about benefiting the community and everyone who listens to it. And unfortunately we can't serve everybody. I mean, we do. <laughs> people who call us, we always help them. But we can't help people in Seattle. We can't in masses, right? We can't help people in Florida in masses. We're, we're, we're a very boutique firm. And I'm very passionate about helping, helping people get from where they are to where they want to be financially. We have people walking into our firm that have lots of credit card debt, no money to invest. We're able to successfully get them out of that and give them that plan to move forward. We have people with $12 million walking in the front door. We're able to help them too. But this Chris Burns guy says, hey, I'm fiduciary fee only. Come invest with me. So what happened? How is it possible that you run off with someone's money as a fiduciary fee only guy? I'll give you one reason. One reason is the broker. They're probably, and I'm just guessing, there's probably no actual custodian. So when you come to Wiser Wealth Management, our assets are held at TD Ameritrade. Client assets are held at TD Ameritrade. So you're not depositing funds into a Wiser Wealth Management checking account. You're depositing funds into a TD Ameritrade account, and you're hiring Wiser to be the manager on that account and manage those assets according to your goals and objectives. Bertie Madoff, he did the same thing on a grand scale. How did he pull it off? The custodian was him. The custodian was him. And he was the advisor. Same people, two different company names. Looking at the Chris Burns situation, that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing a custodian we never heard of, right? And then we have the advisor. So what happens when you deposit money into the custodian that you never heard of is going right into his pocket, allegedly. That's how this would work in a Ponzi scheme. And you're running off with it. That's how that happens. That's how Bernie pulled off the biggest Ponzi scheme in American history. Right. And then that in his car, they found a bunch of uh, cashier's checks. So I don't know where those are coming from, or what the source was. But like you said, you shouldn't be ever actually handling the client's assets in that manner. Maybe he was driving down the road on the day that his SEC stuff was actually due. And he's got kidnapped by guys with cashier's checks and they left the cashier's checks behind. I don't know. I, it looks really, really uh, bad to me. You know, a firm structure speaks more loudly than a firm's marketing, quite frankly. If but, it's but people don't know to look for that. Well, that's right. And that's why we're talking about this today. Because the structure of a firm will tell a client whether or not they're dealing with a true fiduciary, someone who is, in fact, looking out for their best interests. When you say, Casey, that our client assets are held at TD Ameritrade, yes, they are. They're held at a third-party custodian. Clients never make checks payable to us, as you said. They're not supposed to, no. TD Ameritrade sends the client a statement listing all the securities and all the value, uh, the value of all those securities. Each quarter, we send the customer a statement every quarter listing all the securities and all the values. So therefore, you create this convergence of two firms showing the client exactly what they've got. This is what the custodian says you've got. This is what we say you've got. And this is everything that we've been managing for you. The structure promotes trust for the client. And the clients, by asking the advisor, how are you structured? Where's the custodian? Where are the assets? Where's the advice? Where's the payment flow going? They can learn a lot about the advisor. I'll go a step further. If your assets aren't custodied at Pershing, TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, or Fidelity, I would question it. Because if you're a fiduciary advisor, not a sales guy, they're going to have broker dealers that are you never heard of. 
But if you're a fiduciary feeling advisor, why the heck would you not be brokered at any of those four organizations? There's no reason. Definitely for an RA, those are the bigger firms. There's no reason. They provide the best in software support, right? Professional support. They have the best trading desk. So if you're not clearing the one of those four companies, I would get nervous. I would get nervous. I'm adding Pershing because they're part of the old broker dealer world, but they're moving toward the independent fee only. And they are the largest in the industry. But if you're not at those four places, your advisor is not one of those four places. I wouldn't do business with them. Right. Then outside of that, we have Edward Jones. You've got Stern Agee, You've got what are some other uh, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley. You've got these other firms and it gets complicated there. Because those firms are not stealing from their clients, not not easily. There's a lot of oversight within the network of those firms. And there's a lot of independent broker-dealers now, too, that are coming out. There are. And there's more independent broker-dealers coming out. I would argue that those firms I just laid, n- named off, they're, they're not stealing illegally. They're stealing legally because they're selling you very expensive products, really for no reason other than to get a transaction and create revenue. Ever Jones, especially, is I would say is guilty of that. They've gotten their hand slapped uh, regulatory wise many times, but they didn't change anything. They didn't change their business model. They just added more disclosures that nobody reads. Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, there's wealth management divisions for people with a lot of money that you're probably getting good advice. So I think the banks kind of get excluded from that a little bit. If your assets are less than five million dollars, I'd probably question why you would even be in those organizations. Honestly, you're just getting sold stuff. You're not getting, you're not getting advice. So, you know, (laughs) there's a, there's a solution for this. If you want to check the person, you need to go to brokercheck.finra.org brokercheck.finra, F-I-N-R-A.org. You can type in the name of the firm. You can type in the name of the advisor. You can search by zip code. If you have the CRD number of their license number, you can type that in. So I was unaware that there was a firm near me and I did the exact same thing. When I see another fee-only independent advisor, we're almost immediately friends because fee-only independent advisors are hard to find. And we tend to look out for each other, help each other with our business growth. From the wirehouse, we probably can't be friends because you're not working in the best interest of your clients. So I, I go and, and I look at this person. It has to remain anonymous, and uh, I can't say the company name. But I thought, oh, there's somebody near me that's in my industry. So I go and I put his information in to broker check, just like I'm describing now. And I immediately say, no, we can't be friends because this person is supposed to be a fiduciary. And between 1998 and 2005, they had a breach of fiduciary duty, negligence, common law fraud, and misrepresentation. That's a long time. That's a long time to be <laughs> not working your client's best interest when you're supposed to be working your client's best interest. The uh, damage requested by the client was $450,000. They were awarded $204,242. Let me tell you how rare that is that an advisor actually has to pay out. That's very rare because it gets negotiated away, right? It gets, there's so many disclosures that are signed, right? It's very, very rare that an advisor has to, has to pay out. There's a lot of allegations. I see that certain companies will, are more aggressive in their trade practices or in their sales practices. So I see that very often. Certain companies will, will have a lot of complaints filed, but no one wins because the legal department is better than, the other legal department. There's actually, unfortunately, a lot. Over 5,000 cases are filed against FAs with FINRA every year. And that's just with FINRA. So some are settled outside of FINRA allegations as well. I would be interested to know the percentages of advisors, what percent that is. But 5,000 is a lot of complaints. Annually. Annually. Does it say uh, damages? I did not because I'm sure they're all over the place. That's true. And how many won? That'd be another question. Well, the complaint often comes... After they've done everything they can with their broker, who has gone to their supervisor, who has gone to the manager, who has gone to the compliance department and the legal department, and it's come all the way back down and they say no, 
And then so the client has nothing else that they can do other than file a complaint. So think about how many times a client has gone back to the broker, who has gone back to the supervisor, has gone back to the manager, has gone back to compliance <laughs> right. you well, know, with, with, a, with a concern about something that happened in their account. Think about it this way. How many of you have flown on the airlines and had a horrible experience? You got home and then you went to the FAA website and you filed a complaint against the airline. You know how painful of a process that's going to be to file a complaint? That's what it's like to file these 5,000 complaints. It's a last resort. <laughs> right? So these 5,000 are egregious yeah. problems. So there's probably another 20,000 that, I misunderstood, that said, screw it. You know. I'm not going to file it. It gets me fired up because I, I just don't, I don't understand. I understand human beings. It, it, this is a business of trust. And you meet with a person, you go, you know, I think I can trust that person. But you have to take it a step further. You can't go, well, he was on Billy's baseball team and he was a great guy. I've known him for a year or two. You have to go to the broker check and look up the history, right? You have to vet the company that he or she's with and who they're clearing from, who's holding the assets on the other side. And then if your request for financial planning is met with life insurance and whole life and no, and nothing else, and annuities and nothing else, that's okay if that's a piece of the puzzle, I guess. But if you're met with nothing else, I would question I would question the advice. Is, is it a transactional relationship or is it a true financial advice relationship? Those are two totally different things. The two most common claims are actually, you've mentioned it, but unsuitability where maybe the risk tolerance or investment objectives, they're sold some product that wasn't suitable for them. And then misrepresentation where uh, the advisor would admit the facts or um, use inaccurate language that kind of misled the client into buying some product or funds. There's got to be a checklist for this. There's a checklist for everything in life, right? At this point, Matthews, what are some key questions that you would ask? Yeah. So there's a lot of questions you could ask, but kind of the more- uh, This is, and to be clear, this is an interviewing a financial advisor. Correct. Well, the first one that we've talked about is, are you a fiduciary? That's number one. How are you compensated? Fee only, commission only, or, or fee based? So what's the difference between fee only and fee based? Fee only is where you would just receive a fee for your services. There's no 12B1 fees or any commissions on top of that. It's just strictly the fee for the service. A lot of these other firms are fee-based, unfortunately, but you could ask them, do you earn any commissions? What percentage of your uh, firm's assets are with insurance products, uh, mutual funds, or annuities? Do you receive any referral fees from any insurance professionals or any attorneys or any other advisors? And then, like you mentioned, you know, do you have custody of your assets or do you custodian those at another firm? Those are the basics for sure. But then outside of that, I'd, I'd probably just add whatever your personal needs are. If you're in a high tax bracket, you might want to make sure that they have good tax planners in that, in that firm and then the set goals to, to help measure those. So I think those are good measuring points. And I would say NAPFA website. National Association of Professional Financial Advisors. So that's why they call it NAPFA. NAPFA. <laughs> it's true. You could go to napfa.org forward slash find an advisor for an advisor near you. Those are going to be uh, mostly fee only. They should all be fee only through that process, right? Or they have fee based there as well. No, that's fee only. Also fee only networks, another one, but those are the two fee only networks. What's very confusing is the CFP designation. CFP designation is because they have a CFP doesn't make them fee only or fiduciaries, true fiduciaries. Right. They are supposed to be held to the fiduciary standard and code of ethics, but there are fee-based and commissioned CFPs, like we've mentioned. So that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't some type of conflict of interest. Right. You could be at a broker-dealer selling product, be a CFP, and they're held to fiduciary standard, but they're not violating anything because they're operating in a commission or fee-based world. Right. They're the suitability standard, not the fiduciary standard. Right. So the worst thing you do is maybe have their CFP, CFP strip from them, which I, I seriously doubt that that would actually happen, but you don't have any recourse because you did business with a transactional based firm, not a advice based firm. Well, obviously I'm fired up about this. Um, I'm very passionate about helping people achieve their financial goals. You guys are as well. That's why you're here. But I think it's such a disservice when I see things like this in the news Especially, this is the first one I've seen where they held themselves out as what we are, fiduciary fee only, and has allegedly deceived a lot of people. There's no dollar amount figure uh, right now. He didn't disclose any of his um, assets that he manages, so no one really knows that yet. 
I have to wait for his clients to to come forward. But just because they're on TV, just because they wrote a book, just because they have a, a radio show, just because they have a podcast, doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing our due diligence when we meet with people. It's the same way when advisors reach out to me and said, "Hey, I'm in the area and I'd love to meet with you and talk shop." I go to broker check. Do I want to be seen with this person? Does this person have the same background value system that I have or that we have here as a group? And most of the time it's yes. Just the hard part is firms like Wiser and my good friends at Goodwin Investment and Omni Wealth right here next door to us. We don't have the marketing budgets to have baseball fields and stadiums and stuff named after us. We we are um, very much uh, practitioners and they have to work a little harder to find us. But essentially, it goes back to something you said early in the podcast. It's hard to believe that in 2020, we're still dealing with this. As much disclosure as there is out there, as much access to information, as much news that there has been over the years about you know, fraudulent activities in the financial services business, telling people how to determine and discern whether or not their advisor is working in their best interests or not, it still happens that advisors can defraud investors. That brings up another question that could be asked is, what are your fees? It's a pretty basic question, but if an advisor stumbles on how they're compensated or goes around that question, then that could be a red flag. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of people don't talking about don't like talking about fees. We struggle with fees here sometimes because we're so transparent that when new clients get their first quarterly statement, there's an invoice on the back end. They're not writing us a check for that. It's coming out of their accounts if we're managing those accounts. And and they go, what is this fee? And it's like, well, it's half of what you're paying where you were. The difference is you actually get told what the fee is. So yeah, absolutely. People will squirm. Sometimes I don't think advisors even know what the fees are themselves. You have to flip the table here and understand that a lot of the business, the industry is transactional oriented. They want to look like us, but they're actually only getting compensated if they sell you something. Right? I had a conversation with someone this morning about this very topic and uh, someone else in our industry that we made a recommendation to someone this week to put their old 401k into their new 401k. Why would you do that? Well, their new 401k was pretty cheap. It was really good pricing on those index funds that were in there. It's a good 401k plan, cheap as you could get outside the 401k plan. And by putting that old 401k into the new 401k that make them eligible to do a backdoor Roth to where they could put money into an IRA and then immediately convert it into a Roth for the future, right? No tax issues whatsoever in doing that. It's, a, it's, a, it's called the backdoor Roth. It's a, it's a real process. But if you had the old 401k and you rolled it into an IRA as what they were thinking that we would recommend, well, the IRA has to go first before the new money. So the it's first in, first out. So your rollover IRA would have to be transferred into the Roth first, which that means it's taxable. So if you had $100,000, that you'd have to pay tax on that $100,000 before you could get to the real benefit of doing a conversion, but 401k money doesn't count. Well, if I was a transactional-oriented firm and where I had to make a living – I'm not going to tell you about the backdoor Roth and I'm going to simply say, well, we can manage that hundred thousand dollar 401k over here. This is our fee schedule and we'll manage it and never talk about a backdoor Roth. Right. You wouldn't have done anything wrong, but it was not in their best interest. Right. We've had people who didn't want to do the backdoor, didn't have the cash flow to do the backdoor. And we had rollover IRAs here. And then we ended up still moving this rollover IRAs into their 401k plan so they could start the backdoor Roth. So that was $300,000 in assets we used to manage <laughs> that is now in the 401k. But I have a client for life because I did the right thing and I gave the best advice. That's what the fiduciary duty is, right? No conflicts of interest. And if there is a conflict of interest, we have to disclose it. So you're not going to get that. When you start talking about fees, that should open up that kind of Pandora's box of peeling the layers off the onion, Right. But you have advisory fees, you have mutual fund fees, right? They might have a low advisory fee, but they might be using mutual funds that are, are nearly 1%. They're getting either you know 12B1 fees from the mutual funds or they might you might be paying them directly. 
but then the mutual funds are twice the cost. You know, there's so different ways to slice it where everybody's checking their transaction boxes. I don't think that every advisor out there that is non-fiduciary is necessarily bad. There are some good people who want to work at large companies, who want to get their 401k, they want to get their matching, they want to get their insurance, right? And they're doing the best they can. There aren't bad people necessarily, but they're working with a very distorted toolbox. Well, they're incented in a way that distorts that toolbox. Yes. And that's the thing. So like on these 12B1 fees, we refer to them as that. And But in a broker-dealer, they're going to call them service fees. Okay. That makes it sound completely different. I'm getting paid to service the client and the mutual fund company's paying me to do that. Really? You won't just do that? Right. You have to get paid by the company to, and what kind of service do you really get? Do you give them an annual review of the mutual fund? You know, I mean, they're just getting, it's just revenue. Right. But they call it something that distorts the mind of the broker and they want to gather as much of that as they can to just keep getting that that stream of income. This industry is inherently filled with conflicts of interest. The st- revenue streams that can be created at different firms, depending upon the structure, is huge. The number of streams that, of revenue that can be created. Again, at a firm like ours, all those revenue streams are cut off. They do not exist because of our structure. Michael Kitsitz, who's a prominent figure in the RA industry, has a good quote that says, suitability means selling a suit that fits you. Fiduciary duty means it actually has to look good on you. <laughs> that's, yeah, I've seen that before. That, that's, a, that's, a, yeah, that's true. That's a good quote. The bottom line is, I put it in my email tag, fiduciary plus fee only equals your best interest. Um, Anything outside that, you're just being sole product. Well, what's a broker going to say if they're asked, are you a fiduciary? They're obviously going to say, we're not going to do anything that's not good for you. If we did that, we wouldn't have any clients. And then clients just nod their head and say, well, yeah, that makes sense. That is the most meaningless garbage you're ever going to hear. It's, are you a fiduciary? Yes. Or are you a fiduciary? No. And those are the only two answers that should be acceptable. Well, that's it. I mean, if I had to choose between a broken down Ford Pinto or a broken down or a barely running Ford Escort, I'm going to give you the Ford Escort because that's the best one I got. Bad choice A or bad choice B. That's how I feel like when I'm forced to choose product. The industry's changed actually a little bit for the better since I was in the brokerage world. But when I started out, there were company branded products that we get paid more to sell than non-company branded products. And if you got down to a Vanguard index fund, they would compensate you with nothing. You would get nothing for a Vanguard index fund. So how many people had index funds inside our firm? (laughs) Yeah, zero, because you couldn't make any money off of it. In a a fee-only world like this, we can choose anything we want that best fits the client because we're not getting paid by it. That's what you have to realize, that if the shingle in the door says, XYZ company and everything in your portfolio has XYZ company. That's a problem. And people are moving away from that. But still, I I still see it in brokerage accounts where clients coming in, everything's American funds. American funds is not a bad company. They have some great product. But everything, everything in the portfolio says American funds. I mean, that's kind of silly. They're the best asset manager in every single asset class in the world. That's amazing. I mean, that's rare. Their ability to attract (laughs) talent is amazing, right? So anyway, guys, I'm still angry, but um, and we're not going to solve it today, I don't think. We'll just have to keep watching this news story and see how that develops. You know, we hope that he's okay. Let's say that. Yeah. Because we do. But it's an important story to follow. It needs to go to the end to find out where these people's money is. To us, it's a story. To anybody listening, it's a story. But to those people, it's their money. It's their retirement. It's their home. It's their dreams. I kind of look at it as being a parent. If I'm dropping my kids off somewhere, I want to know a little bit about the situation. And I feel like that that's how we should be doing the same thing with advisors in the investment market. You're dropping off all your resources. Every single client here from $2,000 to $12 million is looking at us going, this is all I got, right? And you should do, ask the questions, make people squirm and get the answers. I, I just... I don't understand how this keeps happening, even on small scales. Maybe it's buried somewhere in the paper, but this is a guy that's trying to be us, and he's nowhere close to it. 
and it's just embarrassing. All right, guys. Enjoyed it. Talk to you next time. Thank you. Good talk. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.